Psychology, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk more about the nervous system. We're going to be taking a look at the support cells of the nervous system, which are called the glial cells. We're going to see there is about five, six different types of these that are present in the body. Uh, we won't be identifying all of them. There's only probably one type that I would have you take a look at on the slides here, but uh, you need to know what these are doing and where you would find them at in the body. So again, glial cells are the support cells of the nervous system. Like it says, they're about 10 times more abundant than the neurons. So, and these are a lot of the support cells, the cells that aid the neurons in being able to survive. And we're gonna see, there's technically six types. There's also something that's not on the list called a satellite cell, but there's not a lot known about those. So we're gonna really stick to these five main types here, which we have our astrocytes, uh, something called oligodendrocytes, which is a little tougher one to say. You have these Schwann cells, ependymal cells, and microglial cells. And you can see some of these are found specifically in the central nervous system. So that would be your astrocytes, your oligodendrocytes, your ependymal cells, and microglial cells are all found only in the central nervous system, where the Schwann cell is a peripheral nervous system only. Uh, you can kind of see, looking at this little one right here, that the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells do a similar thing. They both make what is called a myelin sheath. And we're going to see the, if you remember from the last one, we were talking about dendrites and axons. On a lot of our neurons, the actual axons are myelinated. And what this is, it's a coating of lipid that helps to insulate these, not like a, you don't have a bare wire carrying electricity. It's usually wrapped in paper and other stuff in your wire, so insulating the wire. Kind of a similar idea with the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells. The oligodendrocytes are different because they're in the central nervous system and they can insulate a number of axons, we'll see, where Schwann cells, it's multiple Schwann cells doing one axon. But we'll work our way through each of these ones. Uh, probably the most common one that we'll start out with is we're gonna see that it's gonna be these uh, astrocytes. So this is just showing you fibers, neurons, and all the stuff mixed into this gray matter. This is what they call neural, neural pill. Uh, really in a lot of these, you're going to see a lot of the nuclei if you're out there looking at it would be the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes. You're going to see a lot of these present in that uh, CNS kind of non-neuronal areas. And this is, like I said, all that kind of background fibers, dendrites, axons, and other stuff traveling out. So, and to me, this is probably the one I would actually have you look a slide at of it. Uh, they get their name because they are star-shaped. Uh, these are easily the most numerous of the glial cells. Uh, again, kind of star-shaped, a central body and a bunch of fibers going on in a number of directions. Uh, one of the things that these do is they will connect with neurons as well as different capillaries. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is the ends of these, they have these little things that... Uh, they kind of look like little feet. It's almost like a little puzzle piece on the end of these extensions. And what's going to happen is all these little feet, if you kind of fill in all around the capillary, it makes an extra membrane that any nutrients or anything else that is leaving the bloodstream has to travel through. Uh, what we refer to this as is the blood-brain barrier. So it's not that blood doesn't go to the brain. There is really, really good blood supply to the brain, lots and lots of capillaries. Uh, what signifies the blood-brain barrier is the fact that we have these cells making another very selective layer that only certain things can pass through. And that's what we refer to as the blood-brain barrier. The other thing these do is they help to provide some structural support to different neurons. So if you look at this one here, you can see these are those paravascular feet or those false feet that are on the end of them. They, like I said, kind of look like puzzle pieces. And the main thing on the blood-brain barrier, this is showing one astrocyte, but you got to remember you'd have hundreds of these surrounding a lot of these blood vessels and that. And if you can kind of imagine all these little feet going together like a bunch of puzzle pieces that completely coat this capillary, that is what that blood-brain barrier is. It's all those paravascular feet fusing together that they're not really leaving much of any gaps in there, and that's what generates that blood-brain barrier. And again, the astrocytes are the ones doing that. Uh, they can respond to different stimuli. They do not send uh, any action potentials or any electric potentials at all. But the only these are doing is they're a lot of times going to remove neurotransmitters from the synapses. Uh, 
help provide nutrients and maintain the environment for those neurons. And these are the ones that if there's damage to a number of neurons and those neurons die off, a lot of times these are gonna proliferate in that place and make what is pretty much nervous scar tissue, but you're really filling in where the neurons would have been with the actual astrocytes. And like I said, these are what they look like under the microscope. You can kind of see here, a centralized body with all these little things going out. You can see it on a number of the pictures here. That's where they get their name, the astrocyte. It's basically saying star cell. And that's what they are. They're these black staining star-shaped cells. Oligodendrocytes. These ones are really kind of tough to see because the main thing that is making them up is that myelin, which is a lipid within that. And one of the things that we know and we've talked about a number of times is lipids don't stain well. So these central nervous system ones here, it's kind of showing you where that M is pointing to. That is the myelin. You can see there's nothing staining there. You can see the axon in the center of that and then the myelin surrounding it. That would be part of an oligodendrocyte. Uh, these, these ones can associate with a number of different uh, axons at once. One of the things that's kind of interesting about these ones, the oligodendrocytes are not able to help retarget an axon if it's damaged. This is part of the reason if you have spinal cord damage, it is generally considered to be permanent. Granted, there are a number of things that they're figuring out that have led to some people being able to regenerate some stuff there. It's kind of very minimal so far though. Uh, where if you sever a nerve in the peripheral nervous system, it can retarget and reconnect. It just takes a while. Part of it has to do with the fact that these oligodendrocytes are associated with a number of these where the myelin producing cells in the peripheral nervous system, they make almost like a little tunnel that can help retarget. So this, you can kind of see a cartoon version of here. You can see the nucleus. These are these little myelin sheets with the nodes in between. Again, most of our nerves are coated like this and it allows the nerve impulses to travel better and quicker and really is important to the normal functioning of the nervous system. Ependymal cells, another central nervous system one here. These are uh, ciliated cells. They line a lot of the cavities in the brain and in the spinal cord. Uh, there is some specialized ones in what is called the third ventricle of the brain that there is a absence of a blood-brain barrier there. These cells are called the choroid plexus. And those cells in the choroid plexus are what are gonna make what is known as cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. Uh, that CSF is a blood filtrate. It's gonna provide a lot of the nutrients to the nervous tissue. And the ependymal cells by having those cilia help to move that around and get it to different areas of the brain and spinal cord. And you can kind of see some of them right here lining this cavity in this picture right there. The microglia cells, a lot of times when you look at these ones, it's just going to be a little nucleus on these. Again, one of the things about the central nervous system is it does have that blood-brain barrier. What this means is a lot of our blood cells cannot leave. So things like uh, monocytes that would become macrophages and could leave and be an immune cell in here they're not capable of leaving the bloodstream and going into this nervous tissue. Because of that, we have to have our own glial cells that are these resident macrophages that are already there. So these are derived from monocytes, but the microglial ones are these macrophages that are present in the central nervous tissue. Basically, its own army of these macrophages that are traveling around within that nervous tissue. Again, elongated nucleus, dark staining, not something I'd probably make you identify. The only one I'd probably have you look at and know would be the astrocyte. And you can kind of see small cells here, some branches going out from them. Uh, definitely can be involved in triggering some inflammation and other stuff. And again, just these elongated nuclei that the arrows are pointing at. Again, not something I'm going to try to make you differentiate from the other nuclei in this neural pill. Really the last thing to talk about of these glial cells is going to be the Schwann cells. Uh, the Schwann cells, these are the myelin producing cells out in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, these, again, kind of showing you on this side over here, you have an axon going to the center and these myelin producing cells are doing that. Main thing the, on these ones, it's about each millimeter is going to be another cell that is boom, one next to the next one to the next one. And again, producing that myelin in the peripheral nervous system. These cells can help retarget a, an axon if it was to be damaged and you severed a nerve. The distal portion would die away and these would help retarget it back. 
I mentioned the satellite cells, didn't really have them on the first list. These are acting a lot like astrocytes would in the central nervous system, but these are doing it in what are called ganglia out in the peripheral nervous system. A ganglia is a, a ganglion is a group of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. And the satellite cells function in there. We do not know all their functions though. And again, this is showing you that Schwann cell, each one of those little neural lemocytes that it's labeled here, and that's the more scientific name for the Schwann cell. You can see each one of those nodes, each one of those little sections here would be a Schwann cell. So you can see multiple cells doing that whole axon, coding that whole axon. And again, what they do is they wrap around this, have this uh, lipid filled wrapping that goes around the cell and the other was gonna allow the peripheral nervous system to be myelinated. And like I said, a lot of these are going to be, we have a lot of myelinated in the peripheral nervous system. There is a subset that are not though. So again, not all neurons are myelinated. There is some that are unmyelinated, depending on what we're talking about. But again, that's more of an AMP question, not so much a histology question. Uh, and again, the micrograph kind of showing you the axon in the center and that myelin wrapping going around the outside from that Schwann cell. And again, you can kind of see on this picture here where the arrow is at, it's in between two little sections like this, and that is that node that it's pointing at. Again, you, you see it because there's absence of staining, not a presence of staining. So you can see the one where the arrow is, if you look in the upper right, or upper right portion of the screen, you can see another example of it up where the cursor is right now, up there. And again, these allow that nerve action potential to travel faster and without loss of signal or without any type of interference with surrounding tissue. So really the last things I kind of talk about is just some of the terminology when we're talking about this stuff. So in the peripheral nervous system, if we get a bundle of axons traveling together, it's what we refer to as a nerve. We're gonna see in the central nervous system, we would call that a tract. I believe I have it on another slide. Uh, again, a group of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system would be a ganglion, plural of that would be ganglia. And again, a lot of these are going to be connected to some type of receptor system that is going to be allowing the information to be brought back to the central nervous system. One of the things we see with these peripheral nerves is they are wrapped in connective tissue. Well, again, similar names to what we talked about with the muscle, with that we had epimesium, paramesium, and endomesium. With the nerves, we have the same prefixes, but with neurium now. So epineurium is a dense irregular connective tissue wrapping that goes around the entire nerve. With each of those, you're gonna have bundles of axons grouped together called a fascicle. We're gonna have a perineurium that surrounds that. And then each one is gonna have some of that more loose connective tissue, that areola the connective tissue surrounding each axon. That is the endoneurium. So much like what we saw with the muscle fibers, and those wrappings in the skeletal muscle fibers. And you can actually see these under the scope if you really want to go and look for it. So you can see a bundle of these, each of these would be fascicles. So you can see epineurium going around the whole thing here, perineurium around each one of these here. And then if we zoomed in on each of these, that's where you're gonna have that endoneurium, that looser connective tissue surrounding each one of those. And again, central nervous system, it would be Nuclei are groups of cell bodies together, and tracts would be the bundles of fibers traveling together. Together, Again, that is a ganglion is a group of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system, and a nerve would be a group of cell processes traveling together in the nervous system, in the peripheral nervous system. And again, you can see this now with a picture of it zoomed in on this, on each of these little parts of it here. So you can see that perineurium going down through the center here. And again, you can see the fascicles, epineurium surrounding that, perineurium would be around each of these, endoneurium around each specific axon in the center. Again, in the central nervous system, we call a group of these fibers traveling together as a tract. They don't have those same connective tissue elements because they're housed underneath the connective tissue, the protective layers of the central nervous system, which would be things like the pia mater, uh, the arachnoid mater and the dura mater, uh, not stuff that we actually look at in here because it is not microscopic on a lot of those, but they don't have those epineurium, perineurium, and endoneurium type of structures that you see in a peripheral nerve. 
Mainly with these ones, you see them a lot of times in the spinal cord or within the brain, a lot of times either ascending or descending, connecting different parts of the central nervous system to one another. And like I said, ganglia group of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. So a good example, and we'll look at these when we talk about the spinal cord. This would be the spinal cord here. This is the group of cell bodies called the dorsal root ganglion. That's where all the sensory nerve cell bodies are hanging out. Uh, again, nuclei are groups of cell bodies in the central nervous system. A good example of that is at the base of the cerebrum, you have something called the basal nuclei. It's involved with uh, influencing motor impulses, smoothing them out. It's what actually doesn't work well when somebody has Parkinson's. Uh, so that's an example of where you would see a, a nuclei. Again, ganglia, number of different places we see that. Uh, dorsal root ganglion is a good example. Other things with the peripheral uh, nervous system with the autonomics, so like that sympathetic nervous system, as well as the parasympathetic, they all are gonna have ganglia present in there as well. And like I said, nucleus, a group of cell bodies within that central nervous system. So what we'll do on the last thing is we'll look at after today, we'll look at spinal cord uh, and the cerebrum, cerebellum, and some of those other central nervous system tissues. What I'll do right after this right now is give you a real quick slide of the astrocytes, lets you see what they look like on the digital side, and that will be it for this show. What I have up here is a section of the cerebellum slide. Uh, one of the things I kind of realized, none of the slide boxes actually have it stained specifically for astrocytes, so chances are I wouldn't have you actually taking a look at those. But this one, if we zoom in on it, you can see some of these nuclei that are kind of this speckled look. If you compare that to some of the ones that we looked at on the other side there, so here's one, here's one. Those are more than likely are astrocytes making up some of this stuff. So that at least gives you a chance to see where they'd be in this nervous tissue. You can see we're in this area right here. This would all be gray matter where there's cell bodies and a number of neural glial cells and neurons that would be present in those layers. Uh, the other side I wanted to show you real quick was that of a peripheral nerve. Oh, wrong one. Of a peripheral nerve. So here you can see a peripheral nerve with a couple different bundles on it. So overall, this would be that epineurium around the outside. If we zoom in just a little bit, you can see there is a fascicle right here. Perineurium would kind of be considered the areas in between there and in here. And around each one of these axons, if we zoom in on it, around each one of, the, each one of these would be a single axon. You're going to have loose connective tissue, which would be endoneurium surrounding each of those. So next one we will take a look at is a lot of those central nervous system structures. Until next time.